Welcome back to the Brahman Word. We are going to again tackle a verse that is uh, very, very well known, and that is John chapter 3, verse 16. And uh, this verse, I mean, you had Tim Tebow having it on his, um, oh, what, what's it called? The eye marking thing with on uh, when he was at the University of Florida. I mean, th this verse is just so well known, and it's very easy to memorize. But just like Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, looking at the immediate context, you can see that there's a lot to it than just what we memorize. And so with that, uh, go to John chapter 3. We're going to actually start at verse 9, and we're going to read um, just the immediate context of John three sixteen. So you have Jesus talking to a Pharisee uh, named Nicodemus, and this guy should know um, a lot of the Old Testament, and yet he seems to not quite understand a lot. Now, granted, one of the big questions that he asks, that Jesus asks Nicodemus, or brings up to him, um, is that we need to be born again. And, of course, this is kind of brings up, um, <laughs> Jesus says this in John 3, verse 3, um, and obviously this kind of brings up a, a funny illustration in the mind of Nicodemus, and so he says, how can this be? Um, and that's where we get in verse 9. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be that somebody can be born again? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who, dis he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the man, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So right before John three sixteen, you have this talk about, um, you have this talk of why being born again is such an important thing, but how it can come about as well, um. And Jesus basically is telling Nicodemus where his authority comes from in verse 11. Now, some may say in verse 11 when it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony, that we um, and our language there could be talking about Jesus and the disciples. Um I'm guessing that that is probably, it, it, it could be talking about the Trinity, but if so, then I don't know why it wouldn't be um, capitalized and also doesn't seem to, to hint at that, even though it is talking about being born of the Spirit, in, or the Holy Spirit in verse 8. So I think there's two possibilities, and I'm not entirely sure which one. Um, you could either see the we and our as talking about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or you could see that talking about, um, or you could see that talking about Jesus and his message and those that believe in his message and spread his message as well. I think both could be correct. Uh, I'll have to, I would have to look more into it because it is kind of vague exactly what he is getting at here in verse 11. Um, however, he says, look, this is coming directly from the Lord. And look, if I can't, if I can't get you to understand or to believe in things that are on this earthly realm that can be understood, um, 
like loving your enemies and loving your neighbor and and all these different things that Jesus is trying to uh, to get across, then how in the world are you going to believe me when it comes to the heavenly things like forgiving sin and the fact that um, the Son of Man or the Messiah is not coming here to defeat the Roman Empire, but is coming to die in order to um, defeat sin and death. And so... It, it makes sense. It makes total sense. And then he goes on verse 13. No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Um, it, that is a very, very interesting statement. Um, I think what he's talking about here, because obviously you have in the book of... I want to say, I think it's 1 Kings. In the book of 1 Kings, you have the life of Elijah. And one of the main things that we know or we remember about Elijah is the chariots of fire. So how can Jesus say no one is ascended to heaven when there is this life of Elijah and that's how he, and he literally went to a chariot of fire and went up to heaven. I think what he's getting at is that there's nobody with the authority of the Son of Man that has come, um, that starts in uh, on the earth and goes into heaven um, besides the Son of Man. And so I think that's kind of what he's getting at. He's continuing to talk about the authority of the Son of Man. Um, but then you have this really, really cool uh, just kind of fallback to Moses and setting up the serpent in the wilderness, uh, which I believe comes from the book of Numbers. And uh, so it says, And as Moses lift up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So we switch from, okay, here's the authority that I have as the Son of Man, uh, and this is my purpose in life. And it the big thing that I want to draw to is, and you probably know this, that verse 15 is very similar to John 3.16, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So it's not the exact same term, uh, like they're not the exact same words being used, but it's the same mindset. However, there's more to it, of course. So you have really three clauses within, or three sets of of clause clauses, I guess, but you have three sets here in verse 16. First, for God so loved the world. So because of that conjunction, therefore, so because of verses 14 and 15, that uh, the purpose of the Son of Man is to come to to die, which means be lifted up. Um, and that leads to eternal life. For God so loved the world. That's why uh, the Messiah is going to be a suffering servant, as the Gospel of Mark portrays Jesus to be. Then you have the second one, that he gave his only son. Um, and this is, again, this verse is so easy to roll out the tongue that we don't take the time really to understand the depth of the this wonderful verse when it says that god gave his only son it, it's it, it's supposed to bring up in you this grand emotion of god sent his son knowing knowing what would happen to him and the emotion that that brings up in you is not just not just love for God, but this heartbreak as well that God did this, that God had to do this in order for you and I um, to spend eternity with him, um, which is kind of crazy. Uh, so then 
the last one, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life, which uh, uh, which points back to verse 15. And when we're talking about perishing, we're not talking about same as with the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3. It's not that Adam and Eve would die physically right then and there, even though if that was the case, God would be just to do that. But they died spiritually. Well, those who do not believe in Jesus, when they do die on this earth, that's not the end of their perishing. That's only a temporary transfer to the eternal world. And that's where they really, truly perish. Because those who do not follow Jesus, that do not believe in him, um, they will perish and they will not have eternal life. Whereas those that do believe in him, um, yes, they will die on this earth. Uh, well, unless Jesus comes back in our lifetime, right? Which would be awesome. Um, <laughs> but uh, they won't perish. They will perish on this earth, but they will have eternal life. Uh, they will not perish in the life to come. And then in the uh, verse immediately following, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Now, this is an interesting point because some people would point at this poor verse and say, well, see, um, God will therefore um, save every single person that, uh, that, that dies. It doesn't matter because... Um, God didn't send Jesus into the world to condemn the world, uh, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Um, and so therefore, that is, so therefore, whenever somebody dies, it doesn't mean it matter if they believe in Jesus while on earth or not, because God is loving and so he'll just save everybody. Why not? Why not? But then he goes on, verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. This is incredibly important. Um, verse 17, yes, it appears on the surface that it would think that you would think that God will just save everybody. It doesn't matter. But then verse 18, immediately following that, says that that's not true. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. We're talking about the we're talking about the eternal aspect of salvation. Uh, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, even though they're still alive on this earth, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So when you and I get the chance to accept Jesus and we don't take that chance, it doesn't mean that God's sitting on his throne getting his lightning bolt ready and that bam. <laughs> it doesn't mean that at all. Instead, it means that when you and I refuse Jesus and then we die on this earth while refusing Jesus, not accepting him, we are condemned already at that point. Um, and then, of course, uh, you have um, you have judgment after verse 19. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Um, that difference between light and dark is is such a great illustration and it makes a lot of sense too if you and i get so used to being in the dark which because of total depravity we are we are sinners by nature and so knowing that's where we begin is sinners by nature then it is very very difficult to come to the light which is why the spirit has to guide us to that point. You and I can't just walk into a church willy-nilly and without the Spirit's guidance and and his uh, and his uh, helpful push in that direction. You and I can't just walk in there without any sort of of pull from the Spirit and just go, yeah, I'll accept Jesus today. 
without any pull from the Spirit. Now, some people will walk into church not expecting to go there, um, and but yet as they're sitting there, they'll feel this pull and this tug from the Spirit to accept Jesus. What I'm saying is that nobody goes in there without any of that and just says, yeah, I'll accept Jesus. No, there has to be this pull to the light because we, because of our sinful nature, will not get there on our own. Uh, and so... I think that's kind of what's being explained there in those last few verses in the immediate context uh, after John 3.16. So with that, I hope that this little walkthrough of John 3.16 is helpful as much as this verse is incredibly helpful. uh, I hope that the surrounding context helps to explain John 3.16 as well so you can fall in love with it all over again. Uh, But this time even see even more how uh, amazing this verse and this word of Jesus really is. And so thanks for spending time with me today. I'll see you next week with Brown Word. Thanks.